Rod Roddenberry. I've known Rod since we were 14 years old. Yep. Rod is ensuring that Gene's legacy and vision is upheld throughout Star Trek as Chief Executive Officer of Roddenberry Entertainment. And please welcome back George Takei. <laughs> who we all know and love as Captain Soon. Welcome, my space mom, Gaines McFadden. Yay! And please welcome, you probably know him best as Mika's dad, but he played Jordy LaForge on Star Trek The Next Yay! Generation. Thank you all so much for being here, especially on this day, the 55th anniversary of Star Trek. Uh, here is a question for all of you. Gene's legacy is a part of every version of Star Trek, but we were lucky enough to actually work with him on a Star Trek show. Uh, let's start, not, not me. You worked on Star Trek. You worked on Next Generation. That's true. I was a PA. You were. And I'm the only one who, while I was at Paramount, didn't have to answer to the boss. But at home, I did. Um, but yeah. It was the other way around for me. Yeah. I would love to hear about your first meeting with Gene Roddenberry. Uh, we're going to start with George. Well, um, it was not a very... Uh, Propitious beginning. When I, uh, when my agent called uh, to uh, tell me that I had this interview set up, uh, I was taking a shower, and uh, with the sound of the shower, and I vocalized in the shower. I didn't hear the phone ringing, and but my agent is very persistent. He knows uh, how I am, so he didn't stop ringing. And finally, I thought I heard the telephone ringing. So uh, I uh, got out, and uh, I didn't grab a towel. I just came out as I was, dripping, and uh, walked, up, walked over to the phone. And my agent told me I, he had an interview for me uh, uh, out at Desu, and uh, I scribbled down all the information and his name. Water was dripping on that uh, sheet. So I went, uh, went back in, finished the shower, and uh, uh, I didn't look at the notes, but uh, when the, the morning of the uh, interview came, I tore it off and uh, w uh, went to uh, Desert. And I got the uh, uh, bungalow number was right, but the name was kind of smeared. And so when I walked in, there was a receptionist there. The uh, desk had uh, DC Fontana on it. She was his receptionist at that time. Wow, I did not know that. Well, Gene believes in uh, upward mobility for women as well. Yes, he does. And I said, uh, George Takei to meet uh, Mr. Rosen uh, Rosenberry. <laughs> That's better than some names I've been called. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she, she corrected me. And... Uh, that was really, I mean, I was pretty nervous as it was, but to uh, louse up the uh, pronunciation of the, the interviewer's uh, name was uh, a bad start. She asked me to wait, and uh, the, uh, uh, the message box uh, said, uh, she, uh, he's ready for me. I walked in, and he was uh, seated behind a big uh, desk, came around from it, and he said, uh, 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 he came up to me and said, so you're the other uh, person that I'm, I'm going to be talking to. And I said, yes, um, Mr. Roddenberry. I, I had the pronunciation right. And you are George Takai. And I said, well, uh, I, I had to fess up. I mispronounced your name, and you're now mispronouncing my name. <laughs> I said, it's pronounced Takai. However, I don't object to the, the, the mispronunciation because Takai in Japanese 
means expensive. <laughs> Jean said, oh my goodness. A producer doesn't like to call an actor expensive. <laughs> I, I, so he got your name right. He got my name right. And I told him, to K rhymes with OK to help him uh, m memorize. And he says, you know, uh, Takei is definitely okay compared to Takai. And I told him, well, Takei doesn't mean cheap either. Gates. <laughs> uh, so the first time, you know, I had never seen the first series, and so when I came out uh, for an audition for something else, and on the way to the airport, my agent said, who was a huge Trek fan, said, you've got to go a new series, oh my God. So I don't even remember, but Gene was in the room. And, uh, you know, later, when I really wasn't sure I was gonna, you know, I, I had said, I don't think I wanna do that. I don't think I'm gonna go do a play instead. So I'm doing the play, and I get a call one night in, uh, after the play, late at night, and, sorry, close your ears, Rod, but so Gene says, hi, is this, um, McFadden, I said, yes. He said, well, listen, I think you should do this show. I'm sitting in the jacuzzi outdoors. I'm here with my wife, and uh, we are having some martinis. <laughs> and we're looking up at the stars, and it's just great. He said, it's a great life. I think you should do this show. <laughs> and I said, okay. Uh, what's your address? No, I, I didn't say that. I just, I'll, be right over. I'll be right over. No, but that was the first time I actually like, oh, this was the boss boss. And uh, so that was kind of cool and funny. But that was my first really kind of moment with Jean. There's nothing like coming across some home photos that support that things like that. <laughs> things that I've seen once, and I will only look at them once. <laughs> LeVar, if I remember it correctly, you and I were the two Next Generation cast members who legit loved Star Trek. Like, True. nobody else was into it the way we were. Right. What was your first meeting? Like, my first meeting, I was just... I. I couldn't. I, 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 I just froze up. I blue screamed. My first meeting with Gene is a blank. It's a blur. Yeah. Because it was the great bird of the galaxy. Yeah. It was Gene Roddenberry. But my introduction to Gene came through Bob Justman. Robert H. Justman, the, the credits of the original series, when I did a TV movie in the early... 80s, I think it was. Um, it was a very bad TV movie called Emergency, but it was, it, it had a lot of great actors in it. Gary Lockwood, Conchata Farrell, Gary Frank, wow. uh, Penny Pizer. I mean, it was a, an amazing yeah. cast. Um, and Bob Justman was the producer, so I would pump him for information, stories about Star Trek all the time on the set. And one day I got a call from Bob Justman saying, I know you've never done a television series before, but we're doing a new version of Star Trek. Are, are you interested? And I was, who do I need to kill <laughs> to be a part of this? Um, and um, becoming a member of this storytelling juggernaut has been the surprise of my life yeah. and, um, and one of the best gifts I've ever been given. Yeah. Rod, when Next Generation started, you were working as a PA on the set that summer in the first season. Yeah. And I was so incredibly excited that you were there because you're my age. Um, we like a lot of the same things. When Next Generation was sort of spinning up and your dad was like kind of getting it going, do you have any memory of, of were you like around for all of that stuff? You know, I wasn't around. I remember them talking about, uh, and I don't know if I've got my timing off, but they talked about a character named Data. And, and I, I mean, I was so little, guys. You gotta understand, I was 12, 13, and I, I was just into my own thing. Um, but I did know about it. I remember my mother calling the new Enterprise D, it looked like a pregnant duck. <laughs> which I'm not sure how that works. Um, I, I remember they mentioned the kid from Stand By Me. Oh, oh, he's on Lower Decks. 
Oh, yeah, he's not. <laughs> uh, he is on. That's right, he is. Um, and then uh, I, I, I didn't hear much about it, but I do remember that uh, I, I did have the opportunity to work as a PA on the first season of TNG. And uh, I spent most of my time delivering coffee and scripts. Which is what PAs do. And it was fun, yeah. I'm going to tell you very briefly, this isn't in the script. I'm going to tell you my meeting with Gene. It was a callback for Next Generation. And it was one of the last callbacks. And they told me, you're going to be reading for Gene Roddenberry. And that meant to me what it meant to you. And I went in and gave the worst audition I've ever given in my entire life. I was, imagine, we've all been to conventions. We plan what we're gonna say to the person that we're waiting in line to meet, and we get up there and we go, Duh! right? It happens all the time. I know, I'm at that table, it happens to me a lot. And that's what happened to me, and I left, and I was like, I blew it, I'm never gonna be on Star Trek. And someone, and I'm guessing it was at the junior run, called my agent and said, listen, we think he can be a little better. He just was off. And they gave me a second chance, and in the entertainment industry, you never Aww. get a second chance. And I went in a second time, and didn't suck. Okay. And that was how I, that was how I got it. <laughs> uh, question is for everyone. Uh, with Star Trek, this is the indelible question. Star Trek has persevered and remained in the cultural consciousness for 55 years. I know, right? <laughs> Why do you believe Gene Roddenberry's legacy, his philosophy, endures 55 years later and across 10 series? Let's start with LeVar, because Rod has a I'm thinking look on his face. I think it has everything to do with the storytelling, the compelling characters, um, and, and, and the idea that um, we are, as a species, really in our infancy, right? Yeah. And, and I think that the, part of the enduring nature of, of Trek is that in popular culture, it has been, is, and continues to be an incredibly positive view of our future selves. In a world that gets more dystopian by the day, the value of Trek increases yeah. exponentially every year. Yeah. I, I second that. Uh, I think, though, that I'm going to give all the credit to Gene Roddenberry's grandmother um, because I didn't understand Star Trek when I started at all. I didn't understand the fans. I didn't understand any of it. But I do now. I have spent years getting to know fans, getting to know, reading interviews that Gene did years and years ago. And I now have, in his own words, heard about his vision. And it's extraordinary that somebody would have a vision like he had that was optimistic, that really helps us all to think about issues, not just judge them, but actually listen. Um, and he said in an interview, one of his first ones that I ever read, I don't know, it wasn't his first one, I'm sure, that he said, I think I owe a lot to my grandmother because she's the one who told me to believe in myself and to believe in humanity, that they could learn and get better and that you have to be patient. And I know that I can speak from my own personal, personal experience with this show I have evolved, I have changed as a human being because I've learned about Gene's vision and I've learned about how amazing it is with fans and how the fans need role models, how I need role models. And I appreciate very much being part of this whole legacy. It's, it's a very moving thing for me, which I didn't understand in the beginning, but I do now. I'm very grateful. Well, I think two things. One is substance, and we've heard about the substance of Star Trek from both Gates and the bar. But the other thing is luck. 
we had the substance. But when um, the show first uh, premiered, they, we had a, a, a very bad, uh, it could have been uh, worse, but uh, a time slot. Uh, 10 o'clock on Thursday night. Not the best time slot. And the uh, ratings reflected that. We were low rated. Second season, again, it was the same thing. The quality of the shows, the uh, product, the uh, writing, the direction, all were rich in dimension, and yet it was uh, low rated. We couldn't uh, find the audience. And, but what we discovered was there was a small group of passionate fans who just loved the show, and they were also activist fans. Most most uh, shows uh, shows have fans who enjoy the show, but they uh, sit back and absorb in the entertainment, and it ends there. But with Star Trek, the small group of fans that discovered it acted on what they loved. They didn't just sit back and say, "Okay." When they heard that the ratings were low, uh, low and that the uh, network was considering canceling the show, they started a campaign that was nationwide. And uh, one woman, B. Jo Trimble, was the spirit. Of it. Let's hear it from B. Jo. She was amazing. And her husband, John, and her two girls uh, pitched in. But they covered the United States with appeals and phone calls and uh, personal uh, conversations uh, and got all these people to write fan mails, not just uh, in quantity, but in quality. It was an intelligent, literate, uh, well-written and well-considered uh, 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 argument for renewing Star Trek. So the uh, network decided to give us a third season, despite the low ratings. But the bad luck continued in that we got an even wor uh, 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 later and worse uh, uh, time slot, Friday nights at 10 o'clock, which is the morgue hour. Everybody's <laughs> out enjoying Friday night. And so the ratings were uh, low. But the luck came once we were canceled because uh, because we were a low rated show the um, uh, rental fee for the uh, syndicators was very low and so they decided to put us on not just one night a week but every night of the week five nights a week from monday to till friday it was accessible to everybody and that's where we found the the uh, the, the, the uh, big the numbers uh, of fans and that's when the ratings shot up in syndication and paramount considered uh, reviving it as a tv series uh, but that never uh, eventually panned out but because of the fans that discovered us with uh, the uh, five nights a week airing uh, it uh, got uh, revived as a major feature film and the rest is history. Woo! Woo! Um, Ryan, we just got word from the control room that we are super out of time. <laughs> and I, I gotta, I gotta. I'm gonna say hope for the future. Yeah. And I'm gonna say it's because we all share the commonality of wanting to work together one day. None of us see a future where we don't all collaborate and work together. There's so few of us on this planet who actually want to keep division and keep us apart. I think everyone in this room especially, but I do think a majority of this world, they want to share that common bond with their fellow brother and sister human. And I think that is what keeps Star Trek around. It shows us a future where we're doing that. It does. And that is, that is what's in front of us. So, thank you.